Our next speaker is one of the most influential people in artificial intelligence, a former president of Google China and a senior executive at companies like Microsoft and Apple. Today is the CEO of Sinovation Ventures and the New York Times best-selling author of AI Superpowers. Live from Beijing, he's here with us today to talk about his new book, AI 2041. Kaifu, welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on the book, which is a brilliant mix of fiction and nonfiction. Uh, tell us what will very likely happen in 40 years' time in the field of AI. I want to ask you, you've been thinking about AI for nearly four decades when you started as a student at Carnegie Mellon. My first question is, have you ever predicted when you started that today you would be talking at the healthcare conference alongside companies like DeepMind, where the breakthrough proto with protein folding and NVIDIA were using supercomputers to understand diseases like dementia? Uh, I, when I started uh, in um, Carnegie Mellon as a PhD student in 1983, it's almost 40 years ago, uh, I think I was uh, about as optimistic uh, as one could imagine. So I would have imagined we would have accomplished more. I, I, that the version of me then would be a little bit disappointed we have got so little accomplished. But looking at the trajectory, the growth has been very, very, very slow up until the last five or six years, then it's a big increase. So I, I think we'll eventually uh, reach my original uh, optimistic aspirations. Well, I, I hope so. Uh, one of the things you mentioned in the book, uh, you attribute most of the progress that we've seen to deep learning, which requires large computer power, large data sets to teach itself as an algorithm. More recently, some researchers have been calling for a need to rethink the foundations of AI, the theoretical and scientific foundations of AI, to make further progress. What's your opinion on that? Well, every engineering discipline should dig deeper to make sure there is a strong scientific foundation. I think the current um, machine learning, deep learning algorithms do have some scientific foundation, but certainly we would love to get it more grounded. So I think that's, uh, that's my view on that standpoint. Um, the, I think the reaction is largely to the recent efforts to use uh, you know, five or $10 million for each training uh, <laughs> if it's done on the cloud. Uh, and that just seems way too expensive. But if you look at the actual curve, um, I think OpenAI uh, published a paper that showed the state-of-the-art AI uh, demonstrations or applications or algorithms have increased in its use of computation seven times per year. And that's dramatically faster than the way CPUs and GPUs have been growing. And that's why nowadays to do anything extraordinary, you need a $100 million computer to yourself or spend five or $10 million. And on the one hand, I do think we should push the frontier and leverage this absolutely powerful property that AI just gets better with more compute and more data. But at the same time, I think we want to understand the scientific underpinnings and also uh, correlated with uh, understanding of brain science and, and also, also algorithmic improvements of how to build these systems without uh, spending so much money because we're at the speed of seven times per year, uh, even the richest companies like Microsoft and Google won't be able to afford this five years from now. So I think we need to, in parallel, move forward the use of data and compute and also find more powerful ways of computing that are more better price performance, understand the essence of the algorithms and the scientific foundation so we can do better than just throwing data at the problem. All of this should be encouraged. You decided to write this book because in your perspective, our, our global understanding of AI still relies very much on science fiction, the media, thought leaders who really don't have expertise on the matter. And you wanted to tell the real AI story. So, in the case of medicine and healthcare, have you detected much hype about what is announced in the media, for instance? Uh, well, every technology goes through, goes through hype cycles, right? The, the AI deep learning has gone through hype cycles. Uh, 
AI as used in autonomous vehicles has gone through hype cycles, and we're undergoing it right now for health. Mm. And and the reason I, I wrote this book, this is the uh, the book, a very thick book uh, with uh, ten <laughs> stories and uh, explanation of technologies. Uh, one of the most interesting chapters, some feel it should be the first chapter, is the chapter on healthcare. It's reimagining what healthcare could be in the future. And, and I am uh, extremely optimistic uh, just based on the, what I have learned from where AI has been applied to many other domains. We are seeing some really positive trends. One is that uh, healthcare is being digitized, whether it's through wearable computing, multi-omics, uh, detailed uh, MRI, radiology, uh, or extensive blood tests. Uh, we, we are turning our bodies into this quarterly a huge collection of data that no human doctor could comprehend. And once we collect enough such data, as well as outcomes um, and uh, health data uh, from from in longitudinally and also with many people with uh, different countries and races, I think this becomes say potential um, uh, or, uh, uh, amazing source of uh, power that AI can use uh, that can improve. Uh, quality of diagnosis, treatment. It can help doctors in ed their education. It can be a great medical assistant. It can help extend uh, people's health and longevity. And and really, because AI runs better on data, it has to be data that's longitudinal and also extensive. And healthcare promises to be that. And also it promises <clears throat> the possibility of delivering precision medicine that is giving each person potentially a different treatment or at least groups of people, different treatment, whereas people haven't been able to do that. There's possibilities of drug discovery at a much lower cost. That's a lower hanging fruit. So long-term, I'm extremely optimistic because, because we're in the process of this data collection. And once we have enough data, we know we'll be able to deliver, but we have to be patient. So I'm long-term optimistic. Mm -hmm. Short-term, we've got a lot of issues we have to work through. The data is not all there yet, how to pr protect personal uh, data in information, and how to get the, two, the multiple communities, especially the medical community and AI community, to work well together. IBM and Google have not been perfect examples of how these two industries uh, could or should work together, but we'll, uh, I think we'll sort all this out. I think in the next three to five years, there will be more uh, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal headlines that says, you know, IBM didn't succeed, Google had trouble, uh, or this other company had trouble, uh, AI health is overhyped and uh, under-delivering. But I am confident that once we have enough data, uh, these issues will be overcome and we will see phenomenal improvements, just like we have seen for speech recognition, machine translation, uh, drones, and even uh, autonomous vehicles uh, right now. So it is just a matter of time until we get enough data. Yeah, and indeed, one of the stories in your book called Contact is Love, where you imagine a post-COVID-19 world, the main character uses a multitude of sensors and trackers to, to do precisely what he just said, uh, to track her health and, and make sure she's still healthy. But one thing she never does is to leave her apartment. Uh, so I want to ask you, this is what she's part of what you call the COVID generation. Uh, hundreds and millions of people whose youth was affected by the current pandemic. Do you think that's going to happen to the current generation? I think the COVID generation is already developing. Um, certainly, the great majority will not uh, have this uh, nosophobia like the main character in this book. It is to make the story more interesting. Uh, I think most people will still be social, but the fact that we are now having meetings, giving talks by Zoom, this was unimaginable just two years ago. Um, and uh, I think the way we carry on with our business, the way we depend on technology, um, and also uh, communication, social network, and uh, AI technologies and business software is all blossoming. And also social contacts are actually reducing right now because of the robotics becoming more advanced, especially where I sit in China. My packages are delivered by a robot. Uh, when I go to some restaurants, the waiter is a robot. So I think we're undergoing a rapid acceleration of uh, embracing uh, technologies. Uh, and, and I think for young people 
who uh, are used to living in this kind of an environment, uh, compounded by the potential you know, need to protect yourself and uh, maintain social distance, I think will we'll end up influencing the next generation in some way, shape or form, depending on how long COVID lasts. I think we, uh, when we wrote the book, we didn't know if COVID would end or if it would keep coming back. So we made a bet that it would come back. Uh, unfortunately, that seems to be the case so far. Uh, and it will make it some kind of a psychological difference on the new generations. Uh, but, but I don't think it'll be as extreme as the main character in this story. Uh, it's because of her, uh, my, my co-author, uh, Stanley Chan, is very imaginative. So he used that fear of contacting people to make an interesting love story. So that's mm -hmm. um, maybe more for the dramatic impact, not intended to show everyone's going to turn out that way. <laughs> that's good. Um, just to zoom in on one of the things you said uh, about drug discovery, in the book also you mention, you, you give the hypothesis of, of a drug discovery process where mRNA vaccines are developed fast for a new variant with help of AI to predict the protein structures. Now today we have DeepMind and we have BioNTech. What will it take for those two companies to come together? Not, not, not these specifically, but for a pharmaceutical company to start integrating AI into their workflow. What do you think it will take? Yeah, one of the companies we invested in, my day job is a venture capital firm. We invest in a company called In Silico Medicine, mm -hmm. and they've kind of taken the next step, right? Once you have the protein folding, uh, they have worked on AI technologies that will identify a target on the pathogen and another AI technology that will propose likely small molecule um, ways to treat um, that illness. And, and, and basically the human and the AI work together to propose a preclinical candidate uh, much, much faster, three times faster and one tenth as expensive as a pure human approach before. So I do see that this is already demonstrated as um, dramatically bringing down the cost and time to invent a new drug. Uh, I, I'm not in, in, I don't know enough about vaccines to know when this will be extensible to vaccines, but it seems like for drug discovery, you know, if we made available uh, these technologies like AlphaFold and in silico medicine technologies, either as a product or as an open source, I think we can really open up a lot more people who can do experiments and find treatments for uh, rare diseases uh, sooner. Because it, while it's um, impractical for a pharmaceutical to spend $2 billion on a, a rare disease because they'll never pay for the R&D, if the cost comes way down because AI helps the scientists become more productive, then I think rare diseases uh, will become more treatable. Common disease will have multiple treatments leading to precision medicine. So I feel that this is an area, drug discovery uh, is an area where we'll see lower hanging fruits compared to other areas of medicine, which are tougher because we've got human lives at stake and existing uh, practices and uh, um, uh, channels um, that may be uh, upset or disrupted with AI. Drug discovery is one where I think AI becomes a win-win for everybody uh, involved, the pharmaceuticals, the insurance companies, the end users uh, and human race. Indeed. Um, I'm going to now quote from the book something you wrote. I anticipate diagnostic AI will exceed all but the best doctors in the next 20 years. Uh, Eric Topol was spoke at the conference last year, said that AI will augment doctors' jobs. And, you know, he spoke about the gift of time in, in a sense for doctors to care more for their patients. So uh, give us a little sense of what role will be left to doctors in the future. Well, Eric is a great person and a good friend, and I, I think we see similarly, but he from a medical perspective, I from an AI perspective. Uh, I, I think my statement should be read in the context of uh, if we had enough data and an ability to launch and uh, gather more data and learn, then I do think 20 years ought to be enough, starting with certain diseases that are more quantitative, uh, numbers-based, uh, let's say, uh, lung cancer, uh, skin cancer, um, eye, uh, eye treatment of the eye, those have already been shown that AI can do a better job than, than humans in diagnosis. So I think these uh, expert, AI experts will grow and grow and grow if allowed. Um, and if they're launched, I think they need to be launched as a doctor's assistant because I, I, don't, I don't think uh, 
uh, hospitals or doctors or patients will want to be treated by an AI robot, at least not the first generation. So these are pure assistants that doctors can consider uh, nothing more than a blood test that the doctor can uh, consult, um, integrate, or ignore at his or her uh, will. Uh, because initially, I think that human will be much better. But I would anticipate if we're able to launch that as a doctor's assistant, gather data, improve the technology, then it will become better and better. Uh, so much so that in another decade or so, it may become um, the default for doctors to just rubber stamp and say, well, you're usually right. I'm not sure, but I trust you. And, and put his or her name next to it. And at that moment, we begin to see the um, beginnings of what's the future role of doctors. I personally think today's doctors are very expensive, very busy, not able to spend the time to provide the compassionate uh, care, listening, and uh, or to tease out all the family history and conditions uh, and visit the patients at home. There's so many more areas in, in medical care because of the rarity of doctors, the, the scarcity of doctors and, and the fact doctors' time is very expensive, that if we had a more of a work split between AI and the doctor, the doctor can be more of a compassionate caregiver that increases the patient's confidence of recuperation and also, um, uh, also increases the likelihood of, of being successfully treated because of the placebo effect. The doctor is essentially giving more reassurances, spending more time, and then letting the AI do more of the crunching. So I am hopeful in 20 years, maybe 30 years, that symbiosis will begin to form. Uh, how much of a role we, the human race, will permit AI to play, uh, I think we'll have to see. But I'm confident technologically it can do a great job. So good news for doctors. Uh, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Thank you so much, Kai Fu Lee, for, uh, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me.